So when last we talked, we went, uh, we looked at the detail of the process, but since then the apportionment board has made a set of recommendations that are now gonna be taken up on a local level before you go to the legislature. So why don't you give us, you know, since the last time we talked, what you've been working on and what the recommendation is. Sure. Since, since we last uh, discussed this, uh, Lauren Glenn, uh, we actually got the final U.S. Census data, which we didn't have and which were delayed uh, four months getting to the states. So we got that the data in toward the end of August and took a couple of weeks to process it and get it uploaded into some map mapping software so we, we could use it. And we've, we've, in, we've placed the population data from the new census into maps of each, showing each town and each House and Senate legislative district. So you can go to the apportionment board's website and see uh, a map that shows the existing population of all of the legislative districts. And maybe more importantly, it shows um, where the population in each district is relative to the optimum population, which is uh, the figure you get when you divide the state's total population by 30 for the Senate or 150 for the House to get an ideal sized population for a Senate or House legislative district. The maps that we have available show the deviation from that ideal number for each district. And in for the districts where that deviation is substantial, uh, the law tells us that we have to do something, uh, adjust that district somehow to make the resulting district's population more equal with the population of the rest of the districts in the state. So that uh, the voting rights will be relatively equal across the state. That's at a very high level what we have been doing. Um, it's very uh, labor intensive and trial and error in nature. Uh, one of the directives that we have from the, the law in Vermont is that we should try our darndest to not subdivide towns, to keep towns whole um, and not put a, a part of a town in one house district and the rest of the town in a different house district. Um, we've never achieved that, that perfectly well, but we strive to do it. And of course the population distribution doesn't really pay that much attention to town lines. And people sort of uh, pick a, a town to move to, but where they live in that town um, it isn't always thought about in relationship to something like the legislative districts. So we've been grinding away since the beginning of September. The law says that the apportionment board has to get a tentative house redistricting map out to all of the towns uh, in time for the towns to have at least three weeks to comment. Uh, we got that out to the towns this past Monday night they have an, about four weeks to get comments back to tell us, A, we love what you are proposing, B, we think it stinks, or C, we like some of it, but we don't like all of it, and here's how we think you should change it. Uh, and that is um, the map that was approved for uh, review by the towns as you pointed out, Lauren Glenn, is a house map with 150 single member house districts. Currently, there are 44 or so two member house districts. And in some places of the state, for some towns, they have been in two member house districts for many, many years. Uh, examples of that are some towns that are uh, a, the, a good size for two house members, Middlebury and Montpelier, for example, are the right size to support two house members. They both have, over the years, have strongly preferred to have two members at large. Um, the, there was a split vote on the apportionment board last Friday, the 15th, 
of October that where four members voted for a tentative map with all single member districts and the other three members voted not to do it that way, but in, in favor of a map that has both two member and single member districts. The, uh, because there are 44 existing two member districts, a map with all single member districts is making more proposed changes to the district map um, but by, by a considerable factor. Um, the proponents of that uh, believe that single member districts are inherently and fundamentally a better unit of representative democracy. And those who don't agree with that see it differently. Uh, but we're just put, we're pushing this out to the towns for their reaction. And 10 years ago, when the reaction was, was uh, received, the apportionment board um, ended up approving uh, a considerable number of two member districts as its recommendation to the legislature. And of course, as we talked about uh, this past summer, uh, the legislature can do whatever it will and wishes to do. It will, it, it, it's always, grateful for the, the hard work the apportionment board has done, but it is not bound by it. It is not constrained by it, except that we're both governed by the same law concerning equality of, of, of residents. Is there a change in the Senate design? The, the Senate design is something the board is going to be taking up next week. Um, we, I did prepare a Senate redistricting map in July or August that was based largely on the apportionment board's proposal for the Senate 10 years ago. But I suspect that we're going to be looking at a proposal from some apportionment board members for a Senate map that's all single member districts. Historically, the, the Senate in Vermont was uh, based on the county structure. And until 1965, every county had at least one senator, even the, the very small counties in population like Essex County and Grand Isle County. In, uh, uh, this, in the Senate, I should say, has, was always better apportioned than the House, which was one member per town. Uh, in, the, in the older days, the Senate had one senator per county, and then some counties had more senators. And the Senate map currently doesn't look exactly like a county map, but it does share a lot of similarities to the counties. Um, if you go to a single member Senate district map, you will see it look, um, you won't see, the, I don't think you will see the county shapes emerging. And that's not necessarily a, a, a criticism because in Vermont, well, I think everybody knows what county they live in and may take some pride in it uh, or have I, identify with it. Counties in Vermont don't have any significant governing powers like they do in most other states. You go across Lake Champlain to New York, uh, there are county legislatures and county government that's much more evident than in Vermont. Um, so we'll see how that one plays itself out. And we all of this has to get to the legislature by the, the end of November. And when the legislature takes it up, um, when you think about the primary election schedule, there are, are people who wanna run for the House and the Senate who wanna take out their petitions in May. Well, that means if they're gonna be able to do that, um, they need to know what district they're living in. Right. And that means that the legislature will have approximately four months to uh, get this work done and, and settled and signed by the governor so that the people can figure out what districts they're gonna be running in. So what committees will be looking at this in the legislature? Does this go to government operations? Traditionally, the House Committee on Government Operations um, 
uh, prepares a proposed plan for the house. And in, in, in the last two uh, reapportionments, the, the Senate has appointed a special committee uh, and has not, not assigned that to the Senate Government Operations Committee. I don't know what they'll do this time, but that's what, what has happened. And um, most of the time, um, the House doesn't uh, meddle in the Senate's plan for the Senate, and the Senate doesn't meddle in the House's plan for the House, except when they do. And um, that generally gets worked out because it has to be worked out, but there are times when if, um, for example, and in some incumbent House members uh, believe that the House redistricting plan that the House has adopted and is now sitting in the Senate for the Senate's review has done them wrong for their electability. They may go to the Senate and ask the Senate to intervene and vice versa for the Senate and the House. Some of that is, I think, for uh, has a theatrical value to it. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have to agree because a, the House cannot adopt a House plan. It has to be uh, approved also by the Senate and likewise Senate and House. So right now, this period of time, late October until mid-November, the, the boards of civil authority, which exist in every in 250 towns and cities and villages of Vermont, right? They're taking up this proposal. Uh, the boards of civil authority are composed of uh, the select board or city council and the justices of the peace. And boards of civil authority have uh, some important responsibilities. They have oversight over elections uh, to some extent, local elections, and they play an important role when people appeal their property tax valuations. But they also, in this context, are, is the local governing board that is charged with responding to the apportionment board's tentative plan. And the, the board of civil, boards of civil authority um, in most towns uh, will be uh, giving notice of public meetings and taking testimony, uh, learning about the, what the apportionment board's proposal looks like, how it's, it may be different, how it may be the same, and formulating a, uh, a response. A, either we like it, we don't like it, or we think you should do it differently. Um, and also maybe it may be asking us a series of, of questions. That will all be happening over the next three weeks. So folks should be, um, wherever you normally find out about your meetings in your town or your city, that's where you will be seeing a notices for these meetings. And some of it will appear on social media as well. If your town uses Facebook or Front Porch Forum, you can see it there. If you really, if you if you're not using those things, you might just call up your town clerk and say, "When's the board of civil authority meeting, and how do I, how do I um, participate?" So, so we will um, look then for your recommendations to the legislature after you've heard from all the local communities right. on the 30th of November. Indeed, Is that right? Yeah, and so then we'll be in touch again because. This is an ongoing process. Indeed it is. So do you actually have time to do your real job when this is happening? I, I do. It's, um, you know, my mother once, once told me a long, long time ago, and we all remember at least lots of what our mother, mothers told us. If you want to find, um, you want to get, I'll find someone to help you get something done. Find someone who's really busy. So <laughs> I get asked, I'm, I'm a busy person asked to do a lot of things and you I guess you find uh, creative ways to get things done and you find you find friends and allies who can help you get them done and in our case 
we have terrific uh, support from the, the Vermont Secretary of State's office um, doing a, a lot of the technical computer mapping work with, for us and um, the mailings and, and, and so forth. So we're very lucky and grateful for that. Thank you so much for your time and for doing this work and for giving us an update, special master, actually that's your, your title. And uh, we'll get this out so people know what's happening and then we'll touch base with you again in first week of December. Thanks for spreading the word. Appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.